podcast to Ethan Hartwig. A new local podcast is coming soon. The Hub. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the Hub? Yeah, we are your local source of right wing propaganda. <laughs> Stay tuned for more information. It's on Twitter? Oh, that's on the YouTube channel. No, he right literally here. commented on the oh YouTube my channel. Oh gosh. Why, why, Popcorn hey, Hub. Where do you see this at? I, it's on the chat. Like, you can see it on... Did you click here? You have to go on the YouTube. Oh, yeah. oh I Google Synergy yeah. Energy Science Podcast. Yeah. Is it time? Okay. It's time. I think if I put it here... Look for the channel. Oh, sure. All right, when are we, when are we starting this? Our viewers are waiting. Our viewers are waiting. We have 69 people That's waiting. Thing. Actually? No. no <laughs> oh. is, it, is it working? Yeah, yep, oh, yep, there we are, guys. On mine. We're live. We're good. Look at mine. Really? Well, I have a picture. I have that. Oh, see, that's us. Yeah. Alright. All right. It should be us. Hopefully, the mic is on. Yeah, hopefully. Do we have any way of telling? <laughs> This is a live stream. Sorry, right, right, yeah. Uh, someone will comment. <laughs> yeah, okay. It, it, it's uh, going. It's good going. afternoon. Welcome to New Holstein High School LMC. And uh, today is the uh, debut of Synergy New Holstein Science Podcast. Uh, just introduce the guys here. We got Max Knopf, senior at New Holstein High School. Isaac Weber, sophomore at New Holstein High School. Ethan Weber, also a senior at New Holstein High School. A little bit about the uh, the podcast. We we kind of got our inspiration from the uh, the New Holstein Pod, which is a sports podcast. Here, they've been going for about two months now. This, tonight is actually their ninth podcast, and uh, you know we thought if they can talk about sports online, we should be able to talk about science online. And so uh, it just sort of came together rather quickly, thanks to a lot of work from these three guys. And uh, basically, we're going to try to talk about science topics that are in the news, things that. Uh, that we kind of uh, get excited about and we would like to debate and discuss with you. It just sort of uh, came as together you, as you're watching. Quickly, thanks to a lot of work from these three guys. Or questions and uh, basically, on, we're going to try to talk about uh, follow us science Twitter topics that are in the news. At uh, NH Science that, Pod. Uh, and we also have a Facebook we, page. You can like that. So uh, we're going to start off today talking about Mars. And Max is going to introduce uh, some of those thoughts. So, Max, take it away. All right. So, the common theme for today is this CEO of SpaceX, Tesla, and Solar City. Elon Musk is looking to send humans to colonize on Mars. So what he's saying is that, this is, is that this is essential to the survival of the human race. So what he wants to do is he wants to start putting people up there by 2025, and he wants us to become a multi-planet species. So what we're going to look at is, is this even viable? Is this possibility of living on Mars even possible for the human race? So let's look at, could the inhabitation of a foreign planet bring about a new species of humans? With the levels of radiation, the low gravity, do you think that this could ca cause some manipulation to the genes? Like the next the stage race? of evolution, is that what you're talking about? Maybe. Radiation? Yeah, I, I think uh, one of the articles I read really talked about the pressure. And, uh, you know, living at a different pressure, what would that do to our species? And I, I think it's a, a good question. And uh, I guess we really wouldn't know the answer until we, we tried it. Uh, so I think it's, it's something we'd have to consider, though. I mean, to live on Mars, and Max, you could probably go into a little more depth on this. We obviously are going to have to be in some sort of a, yes. a pod uh, or a, a dome, a, a dome, yeah. for instance. And when we go out into Mars, we're going to be on, in, in space suits. Uh, I think they're actually designing some of these things, right? Yeah, they are. They, they do have are. they have some designed already. And um, what they're what they're really looking at this what what they're really looking at is that they're going to detoxify the soil. So they're going to put some chemicals in it to make it actually able to produce crops to grow. But we would have to put a lot of work into detoxifying the soil. Also, for like the first how many years of living colonizing Mars, we're going to have to rely solely on technology to live. So is, is it worth that risk? Because, you know, you burst an air bubble. You burst like a little air bubble in the pocket of the, the dome, and everyone is dead. 80,000 people have gone off the face What kind of, of atmosphere does Mars have? Very harsh, very cold, very toxic. Very, like, there's a lot of radiation. One crack in your mask can cause death within seconds. I guess th my biggest question would be, I think I read somewhere that it takes six months. It would take six months yep. to travel yep. to Mars. And then yep. you have to wait until it gets back into the orbit in order to fly back. So it's like yep. two and a half years for the actual. And my thought was, yeah. you know, what if you need something? Where's our supplies coming from? Right. Especially early on in the first few years, we, we're not going to be able to grow anything. And uh, so we're going to be relying solely on Earth to bring those supplies. I can't imagine that's going to be a very cheap endeavor to 
to uh, get supplies and how many we would need, especially trying to get uh, a few thousand people like uh, Mr. Musk would like to do. So it seems a little far-fetched to me. He said by 2025. 2025 is when he wanted to start putting people up there, and the cost certainly would be out of this world. <laughs> Pun intended. <laughs> um, so do you think that once we do, if we do successfully colonize up there, what do you think life would be like inside a dome with no other interaction besides humans there's no there's not going to be any animals obviously there's not going to be any fresh air per se well i don't know if you guys remember this but uh in my lifetime there was an experiment done and uh it was called biosphere 2 you ever heard of it they uh they basically went in the desert in arizona and they built a dome and uh, you know uh what ended up happening was they, 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 they kind of planned out, and they did a really good job. They had different biomes. They had a rainforest. They had an ocean area. And they thought they had all this figured out with, like, the, the oxygen levels and the water levels and how they're going to purify. They weren't going to send any food in. They weren't going to send in any air. It was all going to have to be done inside. And what ended up happening, something they didn't plan for, was something with the concrete in the dome itself was reacting, and they were basically running out of oxygen. So all the free oxygen was kind of going into the concrete being absorbed or reacting somehow in the concrete and eventually they had to pump in air for them to to survive and so I think what that maybe tells us is that it's not as easy to live in a dome as you, you might think. Now that's been a, a, a number of years. I know we have people living in a space station and uh, you know we seem to be pretty successful with that but I just don't know. Uh, I would have a lot of questions long term living in a dome with a number of people. Especially like if we project this over a few years like if we look back on evolution that took like ages it took forever so like by the time that we think things would happen, don't we think that we're just going to have like a highway between Mars and Earth? Like, will there even be an evolution taking place if then you can just swap? Because if you project it further out before major changes can occur, I know that's just a thought. What are the motivations, Max, for, I know you said a multi-planetary system. What's the motivation for wanting to go to Mars? Why, why, why is he so keen on what? wanting to go there? What he really elaborates on is that it's essential to the survival of the human race so that if something bad would happen to life on Earth or if the life, the climate change would cause for life to be, you know, non-existent, then we have uh, Mars to kind of fall back on. And, you know, you have those 80,000 people to reproduce. And What are your thoughts on that? you think that's legit? I think it's, it's viable, but wouldn't you rather, you know, kind of work on the problems they have on Earth, just spend those those resources, that time, that money to kind of fix that climate change, to make this more sustainable, this more sustainable planet, and yeah. move to Mars when technology is a little bit more advanced and plans are a little bit more solid. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, for me, I, I feel like just saying we want to go to Mars. You know, there, there, there's got to be a, there's a certain sense of adventure. Go to Mars, right? That makes sense. And uh, like we did when we went to the moon, and I could see that as being something we want to try to accomplish, uh, you know, with our new technologies. And, but I, I think that we also need to look to Earth. And, and uh, you know, wh why, why not try to sustain Earth as long as we can? Uh, you know, it's our home. I, I don't like the idea that we can just go find a new place to live. It, it's not Earth. And uh, I, I, it's a little scary, I think, that we're, really, we're willing to just jump to the next place. It doesn't really put a lot of responsibility on our actions here on Earth, then. That's what I'd be worried about. That's very true. But I know, like, if you look at, uh, like, different galaxies, what if there's another Earth out there doing the same exact thing? I don't know. That's just one possibility, like... If they're mm -hmm. colonizing other planets, how far can you go? Well, and he had said, too, that this would be maybe a step. To, you know, yeah, Mars is step, step one. Further, yeah. And then, you know, from Mars, where can then we then explore to mm -hmm. next? I, I mean, from a from a from uh, an adventurous standpoint, that's really cool. Yeah. Uh, I just, uh, I'm a little scared of, of, you know, what that means for Earth. So. But it, it, it's good. I think it's good as, like, a science aspect because it keeps us looking forward. Like, what's the next big thing? If we didn't have a motivation to create those technologies. Right. I think it's important, but yeah, all the risks and effort that comes with it. One more, one more detail about living there. What do you think that the uh, you know diseases would be like? Do you think that there would be you know the common cold? Do you think do you think that all these diseases could survive in an environment like that? I think we would be bringing most of those things with us. So I, I, I can't imagine it really being much different. You know, we're kind of the vector the, of all these different diseases, so it would make sense that they would they would kind of stay with us. I read this interesting article about like finding life on Mars. Mm -hmm. If we find life, what if it's actually the life of ourselves, like the germs and bacteria mm -hmm. that are on us? Because we're not tech, like we're not 100% clean when we go to Mars. Yeah, we're in spacesuits, but that doesn't take away all the germs. So what if when we have humans going around Mars and they find some bacteria, mm -hmm. what if that bacteria originated on the Earth? That was one article that I read about. Interesting. Which is a good point. That's why they're focusing on rovers and robots right now. 
Right. Because those can be more clean than humans. Very interesting. Okay, anybody else, anybody else have any thoughts about Mars or going to Mars? Now, Max, I'm going to end with this. You know, the guy from SpaceX, he, he wants to be there by 2025. Uh, at least have some people on Mars or at least have been to Mars. That's, that's not that long, nine years. Do you think that's you think that's a reason? Anybody anybody can jump on this reasonable reasonable idea or not so much? I mean, like, can we do it? Can we put a person on Mars? I think we can put a yeah, person can, on Mars. Yeah, we can easily put a person there, but is it the best? Uh, is it the best decision? Okay. Uh, you know, a lot of this, I think, uh, the, the the movie The Martian, yeah. uh, it seemed to be yeah. sort of uh, why we wanted to look into this, and uh, it's it's a, it's an interesting thing, but it's kind of scary as well. So let's hope that uh, if. Uh, if we do go to Mars, that we have a better experience than uh, Matt Damon did in that film. Okay. <laughs> I hope so. I think, uh, thank you, Max, for the thoughts about Mars. And, uh, guys, once again, please comment if you have any questions or anything you want to ask us about, anything we're talking about. We're going to move on to uh, Ethan now. And Ethan's going to talk about, uh, start with Zika virus, but he's going to get into some other viruses as well. And then we're going to piggyback that into genetics. Yeah. So Ethan, uh, Zika, we've been hearing all about it in the news. Yeah, Tell us so what's I'm going to first start talking about uh, Zika virus. Um, most recently, it has been um, considered a world, or the World Health Organization called it a public health emergency. So it's definitely something of concern. First of all, let me explain what the Zika virus is. It first appeared in Brazil in May of 2015, so not real long ago, and it's been spreading all over with no real immune defenses um, in this side of the world. In fact, it was actually around in the um, Eastern Hemisphere, but now it's transitioning into the Western Hemisphere, and because we have not develop, developed the antibodies, it's devastating. Some of the symptoms that um, are present with this virus are fever, joint pain, red eyes, and there's also one very bad one, which is temporal um, paralysis, so that's definitely terrible. However, only one in about five people actually exhibit symptoms. So it's not a huge problem for everyone, but it's definitely a problem for pregnant women, which we'll get to in a little bit. So the Zika virus is spread by mosquitoes. Um, so these mosquitoes, however, are not very common in the northern parts of the United States. So we're pretty safe where we are, but the countries like Latin America and down further south in the United States are at risk. And furthermore, research, um, a recent um, case in Texas confirmed that this can be spread sexually. So that's another possibility for transmission of the virus. Um, when a pregnant woman has this disease, their infant is subject to something called microcephaly. So what microcephaly is, is basically um, a stunting of growth in the infancy development stages. So the brain stops growing early on in life, or while it's in, like as an embryo, it stops growing. So, and this can lead to developmental delays, hearing loss, and mental retardation. So definitely something to be wary about if you're a pregnant woman and you have been traveling in Latin America countries where this virus is prevalent. Does it affect, uh, does it affect lifespan? I mean, uh, or can they, can they live a, a normal lifespan or is it just more of the mental? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's more of the mental okay. retardation. Okay. Yeah. And just, yeah, it's just a terrible disease sure. to have. So. All right, now getting on to how can you test for this virus? Unfortunately, there's not real good ways to test for this virus. You actually have to um, be tested in the first week in order to actually figure out if you have it or not. And again, those, that molecular testing is very advanced and very hard to pay for. So what um, pregnant women can do if they think they have this disease is do um, ultrasound testing, and they can also do amniocentesis. So, Mr. Up, you know yep. about amniocentesis. So what you're going to do is you're going to basically... Uh, inject a needle into the amniotic fluid and you're going to uh, pull out some of the amniotic fluid and then you're going to test uh, to see what proteins are there or you could even test uh, the DNA, the blood, yep. whatever you want to do. And one of the problems with that is it takes a while until you can do that, correct? Yeah, it takes yeah. a number of weeks. You know, interesting with the pregnant women, I was reading one of the links you put up last night, Ecuador, does it, they, they're advising people not to get pregnant for, until 2018 right, yeah. be, because of uh, this risk now. Yep. They're basically telling the women in their country, don't get pregnant yep. for the next two years. I mean, could you imagine? This, this is crazy. So it's, it's scary. Crazy. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And there's also all kinds of warnings for when your spouse comes back from a Latin American country, what should you do in that case? So. Hey, I wanted to ask you a question. This, this uh, Zika virus is not necessarily new to the world, correct? No, it has been. So, so it, we've, we, uh, it's new to the Western Hemisphere, correct? Correct. So why, why didn't it cause a problem in, in Asia? Because it's present in Asia for many years. Right. There were a few cases where it did. Like okay. in Europe, it caused a few things. Um, I think it was Fran or France. Um, but the reason it, did, it was not much of a problem on the Eastern Hemisphere is because they've developed the, the immune system to defend it. Right. However, when it got introduced to Brazil, the first case in May of 2015, we do not have the right antibodies to defend it. So now I'm going to transition into how to create those antibodies and defend from this epidemic. Do you think in a few years this will just kind of all blow over because we will have developed the immunity, I mean, I think even so. naturally, without if the you, vaccines? If you look to the past, like with all the diseases, like well, Ebola was just a little bit, and those, like all the diseases over the years, yep. I'd say this is going to be just one of them, but I think we should try to prevent them, and I have some facts about that. Okay, let's hear it. So first of all, there is no treatment for um, Zika virus. Furthermore, there's no treatment for the Ebola virus. So that, that essentially there's no vaccine. So there's no official vaccine for these, which is a devastating problem because if you want your child to be safe from these viruses, you definitely want a vaccine. So transitioning to the solution after I explain what a vaccine is and how it works, it's a pretty slow process. So what you do is you inject the body with basically part of the um, virus the body generates antibodies to protect itself, and then using the antibodies, it saves itself from future development of the vaccine or the disease. Is that correct? Yep. All right. So with that, DARPA actually has DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. They're government run, and they are working on cutting edge solutions to epidemics across the world and strengthening the United States military and just creating a safe environment for us. So what they have come up with, this, this guy's name is Dan, Daniel Wattendorf, a program manager at DARPA, and he has an interesting idea to speed up the process of vaccines and make them more reliable. Instead of conditioning the body to the disease with existing methods, like the slide that I just showed, um, which is randomly injecting a trace of disease and hoping for the correct antibody to be created. Wattendorf um, suggests that infecting an individual with the correct, or placing the correct antibody producing genes directly into the body will create a better and more efficient approach. So instead of doing the indirect approach where you insert the virus, it creates an antibody, mm -hmm. what if you just put in the gene into the body and it'll just generate the best one possible? Mm -hmm. It's also more scalable. So. Like scalability is a huge problem with um, creating vaccines because right now they like create them in hamster stomachs and stuff yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. and chicken it, eggs. Right. And the problem with that is you create a whole bunch, like you just keep racking it up. And then what happens when something goes bad? Like what happens when the virus changes? Yeah. You have all this extra surplus. Mm -hmm. So with the um, injecting DNA and, or RNA into the body, it's a much more efficient method. So electroporation is one way of injecting these genes um, into the body. Essentially, you um, induce a current onto part of a cell, and then you also have the DNA that you're injecting outside of the cell. And based on, like this is a very simplified approach, but based on the different voltages and inducing the currents, you can get the DNA to essentially fall into place, so fall in where you want it. So it falls in the right place. And then it will produce antibodies, which if you look at this Y-shaped, the binding sites is what attaches to the incoming disease and kills it. So this direct approach is much more efficient. Now, is this just an, an idea right now, or is this actually being tested? So they have tested it on animals. Okay. So. I, I just, I mean, I'm wondering who the first human is who's going to try this. It's right. like, I mean, do you want to inject some foreign DNA or RNA into you and just hope that it works? I, it's, you know, but that's, I guess, that's what science yeah. is all about. You just mm -hmm. sometimes never know. Yeah, DARPA is a, is a corporation that is um, 
or an organization that is working with laboratories across the world. So normal laboratories that would not work together mm. are brought together with DARPA. So DARPA really works on the cutting edge of problems. Cool. So they're trying to create a new efficient method which will save soldiers, which will get trickled down to all of the U.S. and all of the world eventually. And another thing about this is if you can do this DNA insertion, you can, or RNA, you can program RNA to only last, say, a month. So you can insert this um, DNA, and it'll protect the person for a month as the virus is going around, and then it will be gone. So that's, like, when you talk about um, bacteria becoming resistant mm -hmm. to, like, change, mm -hmm. like evolution, I think that would be really cool because you can just insert another RNA when it changes oh the second time around, which is much more efficient than a vaccine approach. Well, and I was going to say, it's kind of the same concept. We get a flu shot every year. We get the, the, the new strain of flu comes around, and we yep. get the new flu shot. It's like kind of doing the same thing, yep. but it's just on a more efficient basis, really. Right. It kind of makes sense. More scalable. Yeah. Neat. But the one problem is, right now we're testing on animals. What's going to happen with the humans? And I. Yeah. Uh, so, anybody have any questions or thoughts here for, for Ethan? The... Uh, you know, the Zika thing is its just really hot in the news right now, so we're going to keep hearing about that. And, uh, you know, please, folks, if you're going to travel to uh, those countries, <laughs> check check it out before you go. So I, I, wanted, I want to transition here into what happened in Great Britain um, last week. And uh, what happened was at the Frederick Crick Institute, they, uh, they basically got permission to start editing the genome of embryos. And this was the first time that we ever, anybody in the world was ever actually basically said, um, you have a you have a <clears throat> chance to to edit the genes of an embryo, and what they plan on doing is editing the genes. And we'll talk about how that happens in a minute. I have a little video. They they want to basically uh, change the genes, edit them around a little bit, and then watch the development for the first seven days. So from one single cell to about 250 cells, and then basically they want to see what happens in those first seven days of development, and then they're basically going to shut it off and and the em you know, kill the embryo basically at that point, and. Um, What's kind of interesting is they say this is going to really help them with mis people, understanding why um, embryos are miscarried, understanding about people with fertility issues, and uh, you know just just overall research about how we develop. So what they're going to do, they're going to use a, a method called the CRISPR um, Cas9 gene editing method, and I'm going to show you a little video. Actually, Ethan can start that up, and then we'll get back into this after this video shows you how it works. Hopefully, get sound. Every cell in our body contains a copy of our genome, over 20,000 genes, 3 billion letters of DNA. DNA consists of two strands twisted into a double helix and held together by a simple pairing rule. A pairs with T and G pairs with C. Our genes shape who we are as individuals and as a species. Genes also have profound effects on health and thanks to advances in DNA sequencing, researchers have identified thousands of genes that affect our risk of disease. To understand how genes work, researchers need ways to control them. Changing genes in living cells is not easy, but recently a new method has been developed that promises to dramatically improve our ability to edit the DNA of any species, including humans. The CRISPR method is based on a natural system used by bacteria to protect themselves from infection by viruses. When the bacterium detects the presence of virus DNA, it produces two types of short RNA, one of which contains a sequence that matches that of the invading virus. These two RNAs form a complex with a protein called Cas9. Cas9 is a nuclease, a type of enzyme that can cut DNA. When the matching sequence, known as a guide RNA, finds its target within the viral genome, the Cas9 cuts the target DNA, disabling the virus. Over the past few years, researchers studying the system realized that it could be engineered to cut not just viral DNA, but any DNA sequence at a precisely chosen location by changing the guide RNA to match the target. And this can be done not just in a test tube, but also within the nucleus of a living cell. 
Once inside the nucleus, the resulting complex will lock onto a short sequence known as the PAM. The Cas9 will unzip the DNA and match it to its target RNA. If the match is complete, the Cas9 will use two tiny molecular scissors to cut the DNA. When this happens, the cell tries to repair the cut, but the repair process is error prone, leading to mutations that can disable the gene, allowing researchers to understand its function. These mutations are random, but sometimes researchers need to be more precise, for example, by replacing a mutant gene with a healthy copy. This can be done by adding another piece of DNA that carries the desired sequence. Once the CRISPR system has made a cut, this DNA template can pair up with the cut ends, recombining and replacing the original sequence with the new version. All this can be done in cultured cells, including stem cells, that can give rise to many different cell types. It can also be done in a fertilized egg, allowing the creation of transgenic animals with targeted mutations. And unlike previous methods, CRISPR can be used to target many genes at once, a big advantage for studying complex human diseases that are caused not by a single mutation, but by many genes acting together. These methods are being improved rapidly and will have many applications in basic research, in drug development, in agriculture, and perhaps eventually for treating human patients with genetic disease. All right, so you can uh, sort of see there, you're able to use this pretty, pretty simple method. I mean, not simple for you and I, but simple for the scientists that, that know what they're doing. Uh, the simple method to delete genes, to edit genes, to even replace bits of DNA, you know, within a genome. And, and so what they're trying to do right now is, is just with the development of that embryo, they want to see what happens when you, you know, turn these, these genes on, turn these genes off. How does that change uh, the embryo? But what I think the, they're getting a lot of backlash. Okay, you can, you can probably, you can probably right. tell. Yeah. And uh, some of the things that, that people are saying is this is going to be a slippery slope that uh, we allow scientists to start um, editing the genome, you know, what's the, what's the next step? And, and we get into this whole discussion of, does this mean we're going to start allowing people to design babies? And, and, and that's, a, that's a really a different process. I don't know that we're there technologically yet. But it's the first step. But okay. it's the first step. It's, it, it's the fear. So I, what do you guys think about that? I, where, where are you at with, when you heard this announcement, what did you think and what do you think now? I think there's two sides of this, really. There's the good and the bad. Because, like, the good is definitely, if you're, like, you don't want your child to suffer from any illness. So, right. like, if you know that your child's going to be born with so-and-so disease, if you can fix that, I'm sure every mother and father would. Mm -hmm. But on the other half of this, what happens when people start misusing this technology, which... Inevitable, right? Inevitable. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we know that human nature uh, seems, to, seems to go in that direction. There's always somebody who, who thinks they can capitalize on this, whether it be... Uh, you know, making money, making money, or or if it's designing the perfect race, I, I mean, the whichever way you want to take this. Yeah, like the best soldiers. Mm -hmm. or, or I mean, like, hey, you know, it's not even have to be soldiers, but yeah, you know, I want to make anyone. the best musician, the best basketball player, the smartest person, the most handsome, the the prettiest. You know, I we're, we we would have people who would want to do that, and it's it is a little bit scary. Um, yeah, it's just like the novel Brave New World yeah. that Max and I just read. That's just crazy. The other the other thought that um, some people have with this is. You know, if we allow this this editing to happen, who who's going to afford it? Who can afford to edit their ge their genome? It's the it's the wealthy. And uh, is this going to further the the gap between rich and poor? And uh, will this lead to, you know, a society where we've got these perfect people that have been genetically modified in a sense, and then we have the other part. It's almost like this this next uh, young adult novel we could mm -hmm. write, you know, about this whole situation. But uh, it's becoming reality. It is, and I th the technology really is there. It's, it's how we use it. Now, a little bit about how this works. I, I was doing some research. The U.S. Um, right now does not allow the federal funds um, to be used for embryo modification, but there really is no outright ban against gene editing. And so if a private industry really wanted to get into that, and I think it's similar for China, um, so we know there's going to be people that are eventually going to want to try this. You just can't use federal funding for that. Mm -hmm. You know, another piece of controversy about this, and I, I think uh, – we would probably have people would argue that we shouldn't be using embryos um, for this because embryo is a living living thing, and uh, you know 
the embryo is destroyed after seven days. And so I think there would be That's, some people who have a big problem yeah. with that. And uh, I, I, these, these embryos are probably coming from uh, in vitro fertilization clinics, yeah. uh, extra embryos that didn't get used that people would donate to science. And, you know, that's, that was their choice to take that embryo and, and donate to the scientist for research. I, I do believe there would be people that would argue, though, that that, um, that embryo is a life, and who are we to, to, uh, to put an end to that? So lots of different sides to this story. I think it's an interesting debate. Um, I, I, one other interesting thing I found out about Great Britain last year, they um, allowed scientists to create embryos um, and, and, and actually implant them back in, into the female with the DNA of three people because they had a mother with a genetic disease and uh, they basically wanted to ensure that the, that the mother's chromosome, and I'm not, I don't know what the disease was, was not going to be infect that baby. So they basically had like a donor DNA, but put some of the mother's DNA back in and made a baby with three people's DNA. So I don't, I don't know the technology behind that, but it seems to me that Britain seems to be pretty liberal with what yeah. they're allowing people yeah. to do. And uh, I'm not sure where this is going to go, so keep an eye on that. It's just an interesting thing. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts on that? Can I throw a twist in here? What if, yeah. uh, you know, scientists use this to create a, you know, a human species that's more suitable to live on Mars? Oh, or, you oh. know, like different <laughs> adaptations, you know, Mars. different different skin, different eyes. Or, you know, we can withstand the pressures of the toxic yeah. soil. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you, know, you know, Max, you're really getting into science fiction now. <laughs> I'm but just you, saying. I, you're you know, right. No, I mean. It's the UK it's a doing this. It's also ironic that like Brave New World occurred in like, Great Britain. United, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you know, it's, it's to me, reality. to me, when I saw this headline, I think it was either the end of last week or beginning of this week. I was just like, man, this is, you know, this is really, uh, this is kind of shocking that, that we're willing to do this. But you, you, I think you really hit on it. I think that in most instances, these scientists are probably doing this purely for research. Mm -hmm. We want to know what happens, and we want to kind of get in, into why why things happen and, and like with the embryo development. It's, it's usually, there's the other, after the research is done, the initial research that was pure research, then can sort of go out there and get ch changed right. up for their own purposes. So it's kind of scary. Uh, yeah, like it's really frightening, but I think, like how long can you prevent this from happening? Right. Like, right. I don't know, it's going to be tough to prevent it, even though it's mm -hmm. frightening now, maybe it's going to be normal in a few years. That's right. Okay, uh, we are going to move on to our final topic of the day, and Isaac has been kind of quiet so far, so we're going we're gonna to give Isaac the stage, and we're going to let him talk about what's happening in Flint, Michigan, which is also very scary um, in its own right. Yeah, so we've been talking about Mars. We've been talking about the U.K. and Brazil. We're kind of we're going to bring it back home for a little bit here. We're going to talk about what's happening in Flint, Michigan. And no, not, not the Flintstones. We're talking about <laughs> Flint, Michigan. And they've, they've really been having a pretty big issue with their water. So what's happening in Flint is recently they switched from the Lake Huron as their water source to the Flint River. And the problem with that is the lead pipes. A bunch of people didn't realize this when they switched, but the pipes going to the Flint River, those are made of lead. So they've been having lead poisoning in their water, which is a real problem and it's been all over the news. If you haven't heard, I would definitely re recommend checking it out. It's pretty cool. <laughs> well, I say that because there's some chemistry coming up, and okay. it, it's pretty interesting. It's not cool that there's lead poisoning. Where's Augie when we need him? Yeah, we need Augie in here. Next week. And like I was saying before, Lake Huron, there's also some other corrosiveness in the Flint River, whereas Lake Huron doesn't have any of that. And so... What I've been saying is, with the lead, you know, there's some lead in there, and you gotta, you gotta just get that out. So, yeah, <laughs> lame. <laughs> so, how does lead poisoning work? Um, really, what's happening is, there's it re the lead replaces the metals in your body, such as the zinc, calcium, and iron, uh, and biochemic. This happens through biochemical reactions, which it's pretty complicated stuff, but. We'll probably talk about that in future episodes, because I'm sure it'll come up again. So it's inevitable. Um, and this interferes with, you know, the genes. We've been talking a lot about genetics and stuff. Um, the lead, it, since it replaces the metals, the genes really get affected by this. And displacing the metals through the other molecules, that, that can cause some of the genes to turn on and off, which really is a bad problem, because some of your genetics can just get out of whack from lead poisoning. And typically, in 
throughout the day, you encounter a decent amount of lead poisoning, but that's average, we're used to that. But when you get into drinking Flint water, it gets pretty massive. It, it's pretty bad. So, that's not it though. There's more than just lead poisoning in the water. We got some, like I said before, corrosiveness. There's some iron in the water, that's, that's bad. It's 19 times more than that of Lake Huron. And the reason that it's so corrosive is because the Department of Environment Quality, they've been doing this illegally and nobody's noticed. They've abstained from putting anti-corrosive agents into the water. Because it's cheaper? Yeah, it's cheaper, they're saving money, nobody really cared about it up until they changed sources. And what what's happened to this, you got corrosion in the water and now that they're drinking this, it's bad. But some of you might be confused, like corrosion, what is it? I'll, I'll give you some insight. Rust, for example, that, that's, a really, that's a really common example of corrosion. How that happens is, well, as you can see, there's water. And in the water, there's oxygen. Oxygen reacts with the iron. Not necessarily iron, but in this example, it is. And that causes your product. However, like I said before with the anti-corrosive agents, those are also known as corrosion inhibitors. And, for example, hydrazine and polyaniline, right? You're probably like, what the heck is this? I don't, we, don't, we don't know what that is. So here's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, for that, like, that just showed up. Isaac and I were talking about mentioning Dean Kamen, because Dean Kamen's working on this really cool device called the Slingshot. Okay. He's really involved in creating, um, like, a water filter for all the countries, oh. like in Africa, for example. So he created this whole method, which we'll talk about in a later episode. So it's, it's really amazing. Instead of doing normal filtering methods, he does the whole approach where you boil the water and then you bring it back down. But he has a, a very efficient method, which you can just plug into your outlet, okay. filter mm -hmm. some water. Anyways. Before we get on to the really fun corrosion inhibitors, do you guys have any thoughts on, like, well, I guess I guess uh, what I've been hearing out of Flint, I've I've been hearing you know, less about the science, which is good to hear, but I've been hearing more about the social aspects of this. That mm -hmm. was there apparently people that knew about this and, and didn't didn't uh, tell people, you know, I or you know what was going on. I'm hearing that it could even be as high as the governor. The governor knew about this pr prior to um, all the people and, and sort of let it go for a while, and then all of a sudden we have all these children getting poisoned. Is there any truth to that or? Any, did you, have, you, have you know anything about that? Uh, yeah, I looked into some of that. A bunch of them are refusing to answer, but there's a lot of speculation saying that this was realized before they switched water sources and they just were, like, pushing it to the side. Can you imagine, th for how, however long this has been going on, they've been using bottled water to to clean themselves, to cook, yeah. and uh, then people have been sending bottled water like crazy to Flint, and uh, now they're getting to the point where they're they're trying to convince people to, to um, I don't I don't know if I want to say stop sending bottled water, but they really want to solve the problem. They don't want to mm -hmm. have people continue to send bottled water because it's really not addressing the actual yeah. problem, which is let's let's get their water source cleaned up. And solving the problem is also going to be a huge problem because if all their infrastructure yeah. is full of lead, that's changing every single pipe, yeah, which is a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. So it, so the the lead was in the pipes. And the new water corroded it, and it wasn't an issue before because the water wasn't corrosive originally, right? Right. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So, back to the chemistry. All right. Back. Back to the fun stuff. So a corrosion inhibitor. There's a few ways to describe corrosion inhibiting. Uh, one possible solution would be to just anodize the metal, which is basically saying we're going to put a layer of stuff over the pipe. That way, the water can't get to the iron, and then you don't have a problem. But <coughs> that's that's not the definition of a corrosion inhibitor. So what a corrosion inhibitor is, it's added to the gas, liquid, fluid, whatever it is, not the metal directly. This way you can prevent the problem without defending it. It's going on the offensive instead of the defensive. So this basically neutralizes the water. So you can throw some hydrazine in there. Hydrazine is a really cool example when you put it into iron, for example. So oxygen in the water reacts with the iron, but hydrazine, it does, it kind of like, kind of prevents it from happening. So rather than the oxygen directly hitting the iron and then corroding through electrochemical processes, um, 
As you can see, there's an O2 up there. That's known as the oxidizer. That's what really penetrates into the iron and creates your corrosion. Um, so, what you can do is throw the hydrazine in there, and then N2H4, that's hydrazine. And then, rather than directly hitting it, it splits it up. And then you get water molecules and nitrogen molecules, which do not affect the iron at all. It just slides right by it. It's fine. And people can drink that? No, pr I mean, so it would not have any harm to the water source? Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's like, I mean, it's water. I didn't know the nitrogen. Would it be a bubble like gas and bubble out? Yeah, the nitrogen. The nitrogen is a gas, so okay. it just... So this is preventative, but it won't solve your contaminated water, correct? Right. Because there's so much in there and we haven't prevented it, this is how to prevent it, not how to fix it. Okay. So they've, they've been waiting. They've just been procrastinating. And now it's an issue that is very difficult to solve. And I'm sure that since we have so many great minds trying to think of how to do it, it can really benefit our society in the long run because we'll have so many different ways. You know, it's 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 just something we take for granted, clean water. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. uh, you know, and, and you talked about third world countries, and, and there's there's this debate, you know, is clean water a, a right? And, uh, you know, we take it for granted in our country that it's just something we wake up, we turn the tap on, and we can get clean water. But in many countries, that's not a reality. And so you talk about these water filters, mm -hmm. That those can really change people's lives in a in a in a third world country where they don't have access to clean water or they have to walk miles to get it. You know, we in our society we take a lot of stuff for granted and uh, it, it's too bad. Now we're seeing the results of what happens when we don't have clean water. And uh, once again, scary stuff. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Any other thoughts, uh, Isaac? I have a quick question. Um, yeah. Is there is it? It's, I'm reading an article here. There's also. Um, bacteria found in the water and that's also causing a problem what do you what do you think that they're going to do to fix that because you said the corrosion inhibitors to stop the lead corrosion but what do you think they're going to do about this bacteria that's running rampant through the water pipes now yeah certainly there's a lot of stuff in there like bacteria the lead the iron everything is all bad um the lead poisoning and iron and corrosion that can be solved through chemical means whereas bacteria that can be solved through like filtering and Another well, way to boil it. Yeah, another way to do it is to distill it or clean it through boiling and heating, and then once it's heated and turned into vapor, you cool it down, and that gets rid of all the contaminants. Not necessarily the stuff that makes up the compound of the molecules, but it gets of all the, it gets rid of all the dirt. Are we talking about the pipes from the Flint River to the homes, or the the, the pipes to the homes themselves? So if we were trying to talk about, let's go and change all the pipes. I mean, are we, are we talking about the pipes in everybody's house? We're talking about water main pipes that go from the river? Where, what pipes are we talking about here? I think it's the main pipes, right? I think it's the, all, every pipe. Every I think they just switched with the water. They just switched the water source. So it's mm -hmm. the original pipes that they had when they had the Huron okay. River, or the, Huron, the Lake Huron as a water source. But now that they switched to this different water source, those pipes that they were using are now corroding. Why did they, yeah, change, why did they change the water source? It was, was it cheaper? Yeah, it was cheaper. It was, it was a real hike to get it from Lake Huron okay. all the way down there. You know what's interesting when you start talking about water sources, even even close to home here, there's parts of Milwaukee. Because when you when you tap into a watershed, and to, to technically get water, you have to be part of the watershed. And so, like for people to pull water from Lake Michigan and use it as drinking water, which they do in parts of Milwaukee, you have there's like there's like a line that separates where people can pull Lake Michigan water from. And if you're on the opposite side of the line, you got to get your source from groundwater or somewhere else because you don't want just everybody pulling from from everywhere oh, yeah. else. And the problem is. Like, and you're looking at a growing city like Milwaukee, groundwater can be used very quickly, and then you're, you got to dig wells deeper and deeper and deeper, which is costly. And so a lot of, um, just a couple of years ago, there were parts of Milwaukee that were petitioning to get access to Lake Michigan water because it was going to be cheaper for them to tr pump it a little further than it would be to dig their wells deeper. So access to clean water is, uh, is a big thing, mm -hmm. and cost is a, is a big issue as well. So I think yeah. it's interesting, like, if you, like, this really makes you think about what's, going on with our water we don't really know what we're drinking either well it, I'll tell it you, doesn't look yellow but i will tell you what i taught environmental science for for a lot of years and one of the things we always talked about was that calumet county wisconsin has some uh, really some dangerous water in the ground um, we have we have uh, very little topsoil in certain parts and uh, with all the agriculture we get a lot of animal waste that actually can filter right into the groundwater without without um without going through soil and soil filters it, right? Yeah. And so we end up getting a lot of nitrates in, and uh, every single Especially year Calumet farming. County, yep, with, with farms, Calumet County mm -hmm. will, if you're a farmer, because um, we all drink municipal water,
water. Farmers can take their water and get tested. And if they have high nitrate levels, then they would basically go out there and, and, and work with the farmers to show them, okay, this is a spot you don't want to spread your, your waste because look at how there's little soil here to filter it. You want to spread it here, 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 trying to educate people. But Calumet County, because of the nature of our, our soil and our bedrock, we don't have great water quality here. And uh, especially uh, a lot of farmers have issues with nitrates. So that's it. Yeah. Isaac, are you good? Yeah, I, I think that's it. Okay, well, gentlemen, I think uh, we're gonna about ready to wrap up our yep. first week of the Synergy Podcast. And, and uh, once again, we want to give a little shout out to the sports pod mm -hmm. uh, next door. You yep. know, I, I, I don't know um, how many schools are running two podcasts in a day, but I guess New Holstein High School is the place for pods. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, okay, so, yeah, I guess coming up in, in the next uh, couple episodes, we're going to try to get some, some uh, guests to FaceTime in. Uh, I can confirm that we've got one for sure. Um, Max talked about SpaceX, which is the company yeah. um, who wants to put people on Mars, but they are yeah. also developing, uh, it's called Dragon Pod 2, yeah. yep. and uh, it, it's basically a way to get, get uh, astronauts to the space station. And uh, there is a, a man that I went to high school with, and he works at SpaceX, and he will come on um, to our pod in, uh, whenever we want, maybe next week, maybe the week after, mm -hmm. and we want to kind of pick his brain about what the project is, and uh, he works on the boosters and see basically what a real-life space engineer does. So, uh, you know, tune in for that, and we've got some other uh, possible guests that we're, we're trying to get in here to uh, really just bring science and uh, yep. education to New Holstein. So, yep. Yep. all right, thanks a lot. Signing off. Have a great night.